This is Linux Unplugged, episode 13 for November 5th, 2013. Welcome to Linux Unplugged, the Linux talk show that just can't wait to build email 3.0 on top of an open source system. My name is Chris. My name is Matt. Hey there, Matt. Hey, Hey. man. 13 weeks, buddy. 13 weeks in a row. And you know, this week, this week I feel like we're going to talk about one of my all-time, like, soapboxes that I always get on. We need to replace (laughs) email. We need to just, we need to get rid of it. And there's been a lot of, there's been a lot of, you know, alternatives. BitMessage is one that I've talked a lot about, but it just hasn't really gotten traction. It's got a lot of issues around it. But the Dark Mail Alliance, the Kickstarter is officially kicked off. I want to explain what it is, what they're trying to accomplish, talk about it technically, how they're going to pull it off, and then hopefully at the end of it, some people will go over and contribute to the Kickstarter project if they think it's worth it, and we'll see a new open source email alternative emerge in 2014. Good stuff. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, it's funny because I'll tell you what I really wanted to talk about this week. I don't know if you saw this, but uh, the Verge got their, well, Verge and, and others got their hands on Steambox, Steam Machine prototypes. I saw that. Oh my God. I know. And I thought, you know, I can make a whole episode about this, but I, I'm going to, we'll do a roundup in the Linux Action Show on Sunday. But uh, I'm so excited. And you know what? You know what? I'm a little jealous. They went down to Bellevue, right? That's like, that's, that's like 40 <laughs> minutes from my house. Oh my God! Valve's really? office is like forty minutes from yeah. my house. We gotta get in there, Matt. We gotta get in there, get some, get our hands on some of this stuff. I'm marching through the door with cameras in hand, you know. Excuse me, Gabian. Excuse me. Uh, the Linux Action Show and Linux Unplugged, and uh, we need to see this device right now. Exactly. Uh, but we'll we'll have a whole roundup in uh, this week's episode of the Linux Action Show. However, I'll tell you, I was like, oh, we gotta talk about this day. We gotta talk about this day. But then. Then something of serious consequence happened. Uh, we thought it might happen. Mentioned it in Linux Action Show this Sunday. Uh, uh, Ladar Levinson announced uh, his Dark Mail Alliance Kickstarter. So we're going to dig into the nitty gritty of that. And I pulled a few clips. They kind of had the most unique Kickstarter video I've ever seen, um, where they took essentially what it was a talk at a, um, uh, I, I guess, a meeting of people who run mail servers. I'm not even sure what it was. It was definitely the most unconventional Kickstarter video I've ever seen, and it maybe wasn't the greatest. However, uh, since I recorded a few clips from this video, they've raised $7,000 in like two hours. Whoa! So they're definitely on the right track. So the video didn't really matter. But so instead of making you watch the whole uh, 23-minute video, I pulled out a couple of quick clips about what they're trying to do. And I think what's even more interesting is the technology behind it. It's, uh, it's, It's... it's definitely an SMTP replacement. It's not fully compatible with SMTP, but I think maybe in light of what's happened recently, people might be they might be ready for it. Interesting. Yeah. I want to give a shout out, not to the Matt on the line here, but to uh, listener Matt, who is in Seattle right now. And he has been a listener of the Linux Action Show since episode one. And uh, he, nice. uh, he emailed us and said, hey, Chris, uh, I'd like to take you out and buy you a beer and, uh, you know, wine and dine me. Probably wanted to sleep with me, to be honest with you, Matt. <laughs> it's the hair. It's the hair, Matt. It's clearly the hair. It's always the hair. We're all drawn to you. I don't know. I can't it help it. It's like a big magnet. I, I don't know what to tell you, Matt. It's, uh... Anyways, he emailed me and he said, uh, hey, I'd like to take you out. And I said, you know what? Can't. Sorry, because we're doing Linux Unplugged. Right. We're right. doing Linux Unplugged. I can't do it. So I want you to know I just passed up free beer and food for this show. So there you go. <laughs> That's a big thing. Well, you know? so um, last week we talked about SystemD. We talked about systemd, and we talked about upstart, and we talked about Debian's upcoming choice and the ramifications it might have in the broader Linux ecosystem. A lot of good, a lot of good responses to that uh, episode. So we're going to do more like that in the future. Um, you know, as these big topics come up, that there's a lot of ambiguity around. I think the show can kind of stand out by helping cut through some of that and and discuss the real issues without all of the drama around it and oh, things right. like that. Yeah. So the bulk of our email this week. Our, our follow-up. So at the beginning of the Unplugged show, we like to do a lot of FU. That's our follow-up. 
<laughs> and uh, <laughs> sometimes it meets its name and sometimes uh-huh. it doesn't. But uh, So we're going to cover some of that. Uh, but uh, we have uh, two sponsors in this week's episode of Linux Unplugged, both Ting and DigitalOcean. So I thought I'd tell you about one of our sponsors up front before we get into it. And that first sponsor, of course, is my mobile service provider and Matt's ting.com. Now, ting is mobile that makes sense, and you can go to linux.ting.com to get started. And one of the great things about ting is there's no contracts, no early termination fees. That's that's huge. That's huge on its own. That tells you a little bit about ting right there. Also, you only pay for what you use. If you only use 30 minutes of, of talk time, then that's what you pay for. If you only use 200 megabytes, then that's what you pay for. If you need a gigabyte, you get that. Included in your plan is hotspot and tethering. Ting often sees themselves as, a, as an ISP. Not so much as a phone company, but as just mobile data. And I, that's, that's brilliant. That's exactly what I need because I'm one of the people... Who likes to buck the system? I want to try to get the most out of my cell phone bill by using VoIP services and things like that. And Ting is is a company built from enthusiasts by enthusiasts. And you can see it through and throughout their culture. In fact, if you go over to the Ting Help Center, I got an email from a, a, a listener today who said, Hey, Chris, I switched my family over to Ting and we're loving it. It's been great. And I noticed in some of your ads, you've mentioned that you have a couple of tricks to skirt around using your cellular data. Now, in the holidays, this is hard for me to avoid because family members just call my traditional phone. But oh, I'll tell totally you, deal with it. Yep. You know, yeah, and that's what, honestly, Matt, like, you know what? That's what's great about paying for what I need because in, in November and December and in January too, when my, when my phone minutes go way up, I just pay for what I needed that month. It's it's right. not a huge deal, right? But here here's a little glimpse into the Ting corporate culture. On the community forums, they have a post that I've referenced several times when just setting up a new Android device called Reducing My Bill Via Free Texting and Calls Over Wi-Fi, where they have outlined how you can use different apps in the Android Play Store to use Wi-Fi whenever possible to make a phone call. Now, think about that. This is a phone company that has in their community forms a document that is instructing you on how to avoid using minutes. That's crazy. I mean, you'll never see that with any other carrier. Never see that with any other carrier. No, and when you combine that with Ting's pay for what you use, no contract, and they have excellent devices, and they're always adding new devices. They're adding new deals. In fact, the uh, phone that Matt has, the Note 2, is on sale currently. You can save $31 on top of what you're going to save. If you go over to linux.ting.com, you can take $25 off your first device, or if you got your own device you're going to bring, you can take $25 off your first month of service. You end up paying for what you use. You're not locked into a contract. It's on your terms. And then you combine that with their amazing dashboard. Man, you're really cooking with gas. It's really awesome. Not only that, not only that, but Ting's going to help you get rid of a used device. They've got the they, they've partnered with Glide, so if you're going to switch to Ting and get a new device, they'll help you sell your old device. They'll help you buy a used device if you want to save some cash. Like I started, they got uh, right now, for example, the Evo 4G with WiMAX, 123 bones, off contract, all yours. You can oh, buy, nice. you, can, yeah. you can pick up the Nexus S, 245 bones, off contract, all yours. They've even got feature phones. I mean, there's all kinds of options from Ting. And now is really time to get started because the sooner you switch, the sooner you'll start savings. And speaking of savings, they have a savings calculator. They've got it linked over at linux.ting.com. You click that, you put in your bill information, your minutes, your text message, your megabytes, and then you can really see what Ting offers. You combine that with the early termination relief program where they'll give you up to $75 per device you have to get canceled from your current contract. And now you're really cooking with gas. So go over to linux.ting.com and thanks to Ting for sponsoring Linux Unplugged. Thank you. I love my Ting phones. I've got a couple of them. <laughs> oh, and I'm, I'm just in love in the fact that I'm not married to any one particular plan depending on how I'm using it. That, that's really awesome. I totally agree. Yep. Our first email this week comes in from Jim, and he uh, says, Hi, Chris and Matt. Thanks for the great show on Systemd versus Upstart Adoption and Debian. I wanted to weigh in regarding Matt's comment on that Upstart was the obvious choice for Debian. I agree with his logic that it seems the most conservative way to go in the near term, but I think he missed the importance of Canonical CLA. I never used Debian myself except for as a foundation for other distros, of course. I've considered it and even burned to a CD with an ISO about a year ago, but never mm-hmm. installed it. When I read when I read that time was part of Debian's mission statement was that it would be free forever, I'm paraphrasing here, of course. Consequently, sure. I think Matt's otherwise logical assumption that Debian would go with a tired and true upstart over perhaps less and well-tested system D in the short term may not happen. Hmm. So he's saying the CLA might be a bigger blocker. Now, you, you were pretty confident. 
I, I am, and I think that's a, it's a big consideration, and it's one they're going to have to wrestle with. I mean, in keeping in mind, these are folks that actually had a fit about the whole Firefox trademark stuff and actually <laughs> adopt it, you know, and, and went, went to ice ice, yeah. because of it. You yeah. know, and I'm not saying that's bad or good. It's just their opinion. So, I mean, it's a factor, but I'm still not convinced. Yeah, what that- would happen if they forked it? And like, and like, then they maybe like had some sort of like a compatibility pact, like, hey, canonical. That's kind of what I'm thinking. Yeah. Hmm. I I think that's what's going to happen. I think Upstart at some point, at some level, is going to either they're going to use it as it is or they're going to find a way around any uh, issues as far as licensing and whatnot. You know what? I uh, I don't know if you saw the headline, and I'm trying not to read too much into it. I wasn't even going to mention it, but this just fits right in. Uh, Today we saw that Debian is considering switching to X, or I think they have decided to switch to XFCE. For their oh, default yeah. desktop. Now, one of the reasons I <laughs> would imagine doing that is because GNOME 3 has a dependency on SystemD. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And by switching to XFCE, they remove that dependency. And I can't remember what episode it was, but I actually mentioned that at one point. I bet that they would. Yeah. I can't, and it makes I sense for Debian, yeah. too, I think. It's just it's what uh, that's their whole approach is to not get in the middle of these uh, of these Linux wars. Basically, just to step back and say what's the most neutral, logical place for us to be. And I think that's kind of what they're doing. I agree. I agree. So, yeah. I agree. And uh, I mean, this if anything prevents them the on. I mean, I'd love to see them choose System D on it from a technical standpoint, but I really think, gosh, I mean, after I saw this move to XFC, I thought, oh, I think Matt might be right. I think that might be right. Now, that's not to say they're going to outwardly, directly, just uh, automatically adopt it without any hassle or drama or whatever. I think that they're going to find a way to maneuver around it, through it, over it. It won't be a direct thing, but it will be through Upstart at some level. Interesting. All right. Uh, So, uh, you know, now the big question is is when we find out what they're going to do. MT wrote in, and uh, he said that in the subject line, the future of Linux should be independent. Hello, Chris and Matt. Love the show. But I wanted to go out on a little rant here uh, because I hate how we, the Linux community, are always supposed to be held back because of the BSDs. One major point in your SystemD versus Upstart discussion was that SystemD doesn't support the BSDs. Mm -hmm. However, I I disagree. This is a problem. We, as the Linux community, should strive to push Linux forward to make it the best contender for our needs. The BSDs do not like us. They do not need our help with any project like KDE, GNOME, etc., but then demand that we consider them. They bash us, they hate us on their mailing list, but then when Linux wants programs, but then they want their Linux programs to run on BSD. They rely for years on GCC, but as soon as they switch to something else, they bash GCC, as if it was not providing them with the faithful service for years. I just think that we are so worried about the BSDs while they're clearly not giving a crap about us. So why should we cripple the progress of Linux platforms because of the BSD? I'd love to hear your opinion on this, MT. Boy, you know, I think first and foremost, we're talking about a vocal minority, uh, much as we see in the Linux community where there's a vocal minority that tend to be the loudest and proudest and, you know, most vocal. I think it's the same thing in the BSD community. I think most BSD people honestly don't care. Um, I think the vocal people, probably the ones that are uh, being affected by the various things, uh, you know, certainly I can see I can see where it's point, but I wouldn't go say the entire community as a whole. I would say that's basically affecting a vocal group. And as far as what we should be doing with Linux and whether we should be ignoring them or not, honestly, you know, I agree with the Linux going forward stuff. And, yeah, you know, I, I, I agree with that. I say I look at that. it like this. Um, BSD isn't asking how they can make Beehive, their new virtualization layer, right. run on top of Linux. They're just right. going ahead and making the best virtualizer possible for BSD. And I, I, I actually want to take what MT is saying and maybe flip it a bit and say, I think sometimes when we, I think sometimes it's justified to say what, you know, what kind of decision the GNOME project or KDE project are doing is going to impact KDE because it is the goal of those projects to be available for those distros. And so as Debian is a platform, they want to help support the goals of the software that sits on top of their platform. So I wouldn't discount Debian's concern in consideration for the BSDs, but I would zoom out and say, we shouldn't discount our BSD cousins. It's almost kind of like insulting in the sense to say, well, if we don't provide them with this, they'll have nothing because they can't do it on their own. (laughs) Right. And I think sometimes like developers fall into that trap a little bit like the BSD community is fully capable of creating their own awesomeness that they need for to suit their own needs just fine. And that's why the Linux community should feel free to go off on their own direction and create their awesomeness because the BSD community is going to do it, too. And I think it's kind of a little demeaning to sit here and go, well, if if we don't provide GNOME just right, then the BSDs will be left out. You know what? The BSDs can solve it themselves. And this is true. You know, it's true. Yeah. So I agree. I think MT raises an interesting point, uh, but he does seem a little, a little upset about it. 
<laughs> yeah, I, I mean, obviously this is something he's probably read about or he may even come in direct contact with. But at the same time, let, you know, you are dealing with a vocal minority of people that feel that way. And that's that's their opinion. You know, don't, don't need to get sucked into it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So James writes in. James writes in. He says, um, I've listened to the last Linux Unplugged show a couple of times over now. It was a very good show, in my opinion. I do have a minor complaint, though. Once again, the size of Ubuntu's user base was brought up in an attempt to give their side more legitimacy. Namely, as a reaction to the charge that Ubuntu is the only distro using Upstart. Sadly, everyone bought right into it, as usual, and didn't even bring up some very major caveats that go with that. Number one, Ubuntu does not have a huge user base. Or, I'm sorry, Ubuntu does have a huge user base. That's absolutely true. However... They have a huge user base of highly non-technical desktop users with little to no actual Linux experience. They don't know their desktop gets from... They don't know how it gets from Grub to LightDM, <laughs> nor do they care. Uh, you know, that's, uh, that's kind of true, that, but it's again, like... That's, that, yeah. yeah, that's stereotyping, because I think there's lots of technical users that use Ubuntu. I would agree in that... A growing the the growth is coming from new from newbies. No question. Okay, the, okay. the growth of numbers is coming from newbies. However, actual numbers, I would say that it's pretty well balanced. That's not to say that people aren't migrating to other distros, but I would say that the growth is coming from the newbies, but the sustained base is coming from a mix. He says, so. on the other hand, you got Fedora, Red Hat, Enterprise, Linux, OpenSUSE, Slash Enterprise, and of course you got Arch, all currently using or going to SystemD. That's a seriously massive user base of a bunch more, more technical users in every area. Desktop, workstation, service, clusters, sure. cloud deployments, etc. I'm not really sure where or when the current trend of dismissing the actual Linux power users or professionals began, but I think it's past time it stopped. Unfortunately, I'm almost positive Debian will end up going with Upstart. Canonical seems to have their claws sunk in pretty deep with that community. If they do, it's going to be a very detrimental to the future of their project, in my opinion. And I, and I, I kind of grow tired of saying this over and over, but honestly, these things take care of themselves. The market will, in fact, in this particular case, the community as a whole, will decide which option is best for them. And it very well may be a mixture. So do you what, think, though— I get tired of the victim crap, So with the market—okay, well, yeah. so with the market approach, what we sometimes end up with is like a half-implemented solution, right? We get—I um, mean, so if Debian bought in with SystemD, mm -hmm. essentially there would be one standard to rule them all. Right. Sure. There would be one interface to C groups. There'd be all this kind of APIs that System D would provide. If Debian doesn't buy into System D because the market decides they should go with Upstart, then there will be a more pronounced division in the underlying internals of Linux. Right. That, and that's true. That's true. I, I guess my big gripe of the, the big underlying gripe I have is that rather than concentrating on promoting, talking up, sharing, yeah. uh, you know, the things that you're into, the distros that you are into, why do we spend so, you know, why, why does the community spend so much time hand wringing over something that newsflash kids, you have zero control over? You don't. You can pretend like you do all day, but you don't. <laughs> so we, we have to decide. <laughs> Let's you know how do we take the stance? I agree that we need to you know be mindful of what we use on our individual systems, but the but you got to be careful not to fall into the victim trap. And I don't mean that in a derogatory sense. I mean that factually. You you come out you come out on the losing end of it. Really. Yeah, yeah. The victim camp. Yeah, you got to avoid yeah. that. You got to avoid that. Just and doesn't it, work. Yeah, and it's hard when you get really you get wrapped up into it. You know, and you see you know anytime anytime an issue becomes clear from beginning to end yeah. to you and you can see an injustice or you can see sure. a logical, it's very hard not to get upset by it. And yeah. I think the only reason why other stuff doesn't upset people is because they just don't get as invested in it. But well, if you got invested in politics or sports, you get just as upset, right? This is true. I mean, good example. Earlier, we had a big Skype crash. I mean, it was a pain in the butt. And boy, how do you, you know, I could sit there and just shake my fist, oh, Microsoft, <laughs> you, how dare you crash that application right. that I chose to install and use. And we could I mean, have a debate, you know, should we drop Skype or <laughs> switch right. to Mumble, you know, like all these technical discussions or do i suck it up and either continue to use it or use something else i mean yeah. really it's yeah. really what it comes down to so yeah, anyway that's my take you. on it uh, i wanted to say um <laughs> i'm sorry i i made uh -oh. a little uh, i made a little boo boo last week get it out of here uh oh yeah uh so oh my god matt so after last week's linux unplugged i lost all access to my google account oh no <laughs> full on couldn't get to docs couldn't get to youtube oh, wow. couldn't get to my email and of course i couldn't get to the jupiter broadcasting youtube account well this happened while I was posting Linux Unplugged. Oh, so wow. normally, if, if you notice, what happens on the Jupyter Broadcasting website is right when a show comes out, I, I post on the website and I use the YouTube embed. And that's because WebM is horrible technology and takes way too long to encode. Literally, like if, if the HD version of Linux Unplugged, it might take 25 minutes to encode and the WebM version, not exaggerating at all, will probably take two and a half hours to encode. 
And it's that kind of half hour, two and a half hours. So YouTube's down because I can't get to my Google account. So I say, screw it. I'll just go straight to the HTML5 version. And I posted it on our website, Linux Unplugged, HTML5 version. And because the WebM wasn't ready yet, I just didn't link it. Well, on a ton of Linux desktops, if you don't have the WebM, well, anyone using Chromium or Chrome on the Linux desktop, if you don't have WebM uh, embedded, it won't play. It just sits there and spins for a while. So a bunch of people couldn't play last week's episode on the HTML5 player. I apologize. I did get the web WebM version up later, but because it took so long to encode, it, it, it was like a couple of days later. So my apologies to those of you who had problems. We got a lot of people emailed and said, I couldn't play the episode. <laughs> the direct download links, by the way, folks. Uh, so where the so you have the video embed, then where the show description is, you scroll down a little bit, direct download links. You just download them right there. We got torrent feeds and everything. Uh, but that was my bad. That was my bad. Well, I think that's an important piece to re- to really realize is that sometimes those things happen, and that is so frustrating for the end user. I totally get that. Yeah, but the yeah. cool thing is that we do have that alternative option. So if you run into a problem, mm-hmm. just remember, we probably got you covered. No worries. Yeah. And there also I try to link the YouTube version, which you can go watch yeah. and, and all of that. Um, so this week uh, I wanted to uh, – I oh, God, did I get – yeah, here we go. This is our – Speculatortron. You like that? The Speculatortron. Oh, yeah. And we're going to look into the future, the, the, the distant year 2000 future, and we're going to talk about replacing email. A Lava Bits dark mail initiative uh, launched on Kickstarter this week, and our community's been talking about it in our subreddit. I actually already became a backer, 35 bucks worth, nothing outrageous, but uh, I became sure, a backer. Yeah. And I want to talk about this today because this is, a as a former sysadmin, but also now as a business owner, these are... Placing email is kind of a big topic for me uh, because I got to I gotta replace it with something that solves the needs of a small business. I want something secure and safe because I, I get hundreds of emails from people outside the country in a week. And, you know, so I, I never know who I'm getting emails from. Right. And I also want something that's easy enough that uh, is just sort of doesn't have a cognitive burden, as they put it. <laughs> and so I want to talk about the dark mail initiative. I want to break it down. And the fact that it's open sourced, it's going to run on Linux. All of that is going to be a point of our conversation today. Uh, but before we get into that, I want to thank a new sponsor on Linux Unplugged, and that is DigitalOcean. Now, if you're not familiar with DigitalOcean, they've cracked it. They've solved it. DigitalOcean is simple cloud hosting dedicated to offering the most intuitive and easy to spin up cloud servers. And the this is, I, I'll tell you a little bit about the, the uh, DigitalOcean cloud server I spun up last night. By the way, Check this out, Matt. Users can create a cloud server in less than 55 seconds. Pricing plans start at only $5 per month, which gets you 512 megs of RAM, 20 gigabytes of SSD storage, a CPU, and a wow. terabyte of transfer. A terabyte of transfer for $5 a month. The interface is so simple. So if you're watching our video version here, I've got uh, my personal uh, digital ocean uh, control panel up. And uh, so you go, you go to create, and then you select your size. So here I have a 512 megabyte uh, cloud server, one CPU, 20 gigs of uh, SSD, and a terabyte of transfer, five bucks a month. That's now that, crazy. That's a great deal. That's a great uh, deal. If you use the code Linux13, this is episode 13, Linux13, they'll give you a $10 credit. That's basically two months. You can get a DigitalOcean server for free for two months. So what I did is I went in here and I said I want the 512 box. And then you select your region. They got New York, Amsterdam, San Francisco, and another New York location. So I went. I decided to go East Coast, and I'll tell you why here in a second. Okay. Then you go down and select your image. Now they've got everything from Ubuntu 13.10 through Ubuntu 10.04. They got CentOS from version 6.4 to 5.8. They've got Debian from version 7.0 to 6.0. But Matt, then they got Fedora too. But Matt. They it's have the Arch. arch. They've I got mean, Arch. I couldn't believe that. It's like, oh my God. It's like all those times you're wondering, I wonder how Arch would handle this. Well, there you go, right? I mean, so so that's wow. what I did. I, I spun up an Arch uh, huh. an Arch server. They've got the uh they've got the uh, May snapshot. So you and you know that's the so you click that image, you get the minimal arch system just image to your box. So it's totally set up. You generate the root password, you log in, you've got root access at this point. You can set up an even any encryption you want, anything like that. You know what I decided to do? One <laughs> what did you do? One of the things I've been trying to figure out a way to utilize, and but also make a good experience is BitTorrent Sync. 
BitTorrent Sync offers just incredible possibilities for content distribution. And I've been experimenting with distributing the Unfiltered Supporter Show and, and Clips catalog using BitTorrent Sync. So I spun up an Arch Linux box on the oh. East Coast running BitTorrent Sync. This got a copy of all of the Unfiltered Supporter stuff on there. So when new members join the Unfiltered Supporters Club, they get seated from a New York server and from my server here on the West Coast. So I've got now I've got servers on both coasts of the United States seating the Un- Unfiltered Supporters Club. So it just makes it super crazy fast. And Matt, I brought my Archbox up to total current. First thing I did, Matt, when I when I logged in, right, is I just brought that sucker up to date. I was pulling down packages from the Arch repo at 9, 10 megabytes a second. Whoa! Yeah. And, seriously. And that all goes on those SSD hard drives. So when you, when you combine that crazy speed with those SSD hard drives, it is absolutely mind-blowing. DigitalOcean also offers a vast collection of tutorials in their community section. This is awesome, Matt. Users can submit articles to the community and get paid $50 per published piece. So if you feel like you have an article you could write that would help the DigitalOcean community, if if DigitalOcean selects really it, cool. they'll give yeah. you 50 bones. I know. So I'll put a link to that in the show notes if you guys want to check that out. And if you want to go check out DigitalOcean, use the code LINUX13 when you check out. That'll get you a $10 credit. So if you get the $5 uh, box, that's going to get you two months of DigitalOcean for free. Not only... Not only can you select like base images, but under the applications tab, you can just say, well, I just want a LAMP stack on Ubuntu 12.04. Just oh. spin that up. Or I want Ruby on Rails on Ubuntu 12.04. Or I want Ghost on Ubuntu 12.04. Like you can just push those out right then and there. Uh, you, have, you can have stored images. So once you have something, you can snapshot it and then redeploy that later on. You can back things up. You can destroy images if you don't like them. They support Docker containers. So you can create something locally and ship it up to them using Docker. And then on the back end, they're using Linux and KVM to make it all possible. And I love the interface. I love as you're bouncing from tab to tab. It's it's physically impossible to get lost and confused yeah, yeah. as to what you're doing. You don't even have to know what it's, any of this means. And it's you so can still awesome. Do it. It's so awesome. It's like awesome. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we were just talking on the uh, pre-show with some of our Mumble uh, folks, and uh, uh, they were mentioning it was a JB Viewer sixty six. He was mentioning that uh, he's uh, he's had he's been a Digital Ocean customer for a long time, and support <laughs> questions get answered super quick, super fast. Right. I, I couldn't believe, like their claim, you spin up a server in 55 seconds, yeah. is totally legit. I spun up an That's arch box awesome. in 55 seconds, and I owned it, and then I got geeky, Matt. I got super geeky, like I SSH'd into it with X11 forwarding, so then, <laughs> and, and then I installed Firefox, and only the X11 dependencies I had to have, and then oh I'm my forwarding God. my Firefox session and configuring my BitTorrent sync through localhost, that way I don't have to open up a remote listening port. It was awesome! That is so cool. Good you, deal. You feel that SSD speed, too. So uh, go over to DigitalOcean.com and use the promo code LINUX13 to get a $10 DigitalOcean credit. And uh, thanks very much to DigitalOcean for sponsoring this episode of Linux Unplugged. We'll have a link in our show notes as well. I'm going to be checking that out after the show. That is fantastic. Oh, yeah, buddy. It was so. I was like, I, I walked over to my wife and I'm like... Okay, I got to apologize. I'm really geeking out tonight. I just did the coolest thing. <laughs> did you get the geek, the geek twitch? You know, that did, twitch totally. you get when you're about to do something really geeky. I, I yeah. absolutely did. Uh, so uh, switching gears to uh, to the LavaBit uh, Dark Mail initiative, uh, I thought let's back up a little bit and then we'll open up to the mumble room too. But let's uh, start with uh, Ladar's introduction of the goals around Dark Mail and what it is. Um, I've been working with Mike Jenke and his team at Silent Circle, Phil Zimmerman and John Callis. Um, and we've been working on a little project we're calling Dark Mail. We thought Black Mail kind of gave the wrong connotation. <laughs> and what we're doing is we're setting up a little nonprofit called the Dark Mail Alliance um, that would be the group that we're using to maintain and control the intellectual property related to this new protocol. I think if I had come to you guys two, three years ago and said, hey, it's time to toss out all the mail protocols and replace them with ones that integrate security, all of you would have laughed at me. You would have said, you want to throw out how many man hours of work all for this hypothetical threat that we don't know exists? Well, I think after the summer of Snowden, hopefully you guys have a slightly different attitude about how important security is and how insecure many of the protocols that we use every day. So uh, that's Ladar, uh, the uh, f- owner, I guess, of LavaBit, which was shut down uh, as, uh, be- as it became public that Edward Snowden had used uh, LavaBit as his mail server, and then they wanted right. 
car blanche access to all of uh, the mail records there. And he makes a very good point is in the past, and I think this is very legitimate to the conversation in the past, if if somebody come along and said, well, we want to replace email, but we don't want to use SMTP, people would have laughed them right out of the room. Oh, they really would have too. Yeah. And and it's it's now to the point where it's like, okay, well, I'm willing to seriously consider this. In fact, uh, I was reading some of the comments in our subreddit and uh, uh, Josh uh, Strobel wrote, I personally threw in 35 bucks. I look forward to LavaBit code being open source, the Dark Mail Alliance making the protocol open, and the fact that they are tailoring this to everyone ranging from service providers to your grandmother. End, end encryption is absolutely needed. Um, somebody else wrote uh, uh, that uh, he says, uh, this was uh, uh, Buffus Bree 66 he says, I'm going to throw in 100 when I get paid. This is the first SMTP killer I really believe in, and SMTP really needs to die a painful death. I think it... Yeah. I think this will also be a great time for companies like Google and Yahoo have been t- leaking bits and pieces of conversation starting how they hate the a- a- NSA and GCHQ. Uh, so I thought, you know, these are, I'm too, like these guys are ready. I'm ready. Yes. But it's, it's not only has, have we needed the right time, but we've needed the right team. And I think that's the other thing that the Dark Mail Alliance has is the right team. Basically what you've got is you've got uh, a real interesting mix going on here. You've got the Phil Zerman, who John and I is the co-founder of Silent Circle along with John and I, uh, creator of PGP. You got John Callis, who's the creator of PGP Universal Server and Apple's whole disk encryption. And you got Ladar, who, if you haven't figured it out, is one hell of an engineer. I mean, it's kind of the dream team. It really is. And I think that was the missing piece, as you pointed out. These are the people who needed to come together to actually make this come to fruition and come to reality. And what one of the things that's, I think, probably important to understand is, so this is, what this Kickstarter is funding is uh, developers. It, it is not necessarily funding the product directly itself, but funding hiring the developers to work on cleaning up LavaBit source code and open sourcing it. And, and at the end, the end product will be, it was essentially a series of protocols. This is really a set of protocols. And it's a set of protocols that has as the goal, you start out with security. And for those who need to dial the security down, you can dial the security down. The problem right now is that email has no security and you're forced to dial it up and you can only dial it up to a certain point. There's lots of metadata in every email that absolutely cannot be protected at all. Such a great point, right? Email starts insecure by default and then you can try to force all of these security layers on top of it. But at the end of the day, the metadata is still exposed, right? Well, and it's just a Band-Aid solution. I mean, that's the bigger picture is that no matter how much how much wrapping you put around it, that metadata being exposed is going to be the downfall of anything you're trying to protect. I mean, it really doesn't work. There's so much you can draw from the metadata. Mm-hmm. I talked to this person at this time yep. over this time period right after I dropped off the backpack in front of the trash can, right? And exactly. That's, and that's really all they need. They don't even need the contents of it. But what also inspires me about this dark mail initiative isn't so much what they're saying now and the fact that it's going to be open source, but the fact that it's probably going to be based on a technology that they've already got working. What we're thinking about doing is basically building a new messaging protocol based around JSON that, like he said, includes security by default. I would say we already have it. Yeah, we already have, have a working yeah, I mean, prototype of it. That our, our texting system, silent text, basically works this way. That, that if I send you the equivalent of an MMS, you know, I text you a picture, what happens is that you get an encrypted, S- MMS, an encrypted XMPP message that tells you where to go get the picture, and the picture is end-to-end encrypted between me and you, and nobody else can decrypt it at all. So what they're going to do is uh, the system will use XMPP for the communications between clients. It will go to a client and say, hey, so when I send Matt an email, it'll say, or uh, I guess a dark mail, it'll say, you'll get essentially a notification that, hey, Matt, there is a goodies waiting for you on this server. Now, that could be Chris's server. That could be some, that could be Gmail that's implemented this protocol. That could be anything that kind of cloud storage. And then your client will go out and get this encrypted bundle and pull it down. That'll be the actual message contents. Now, that gets encrypted on my end using a key that it gets generated on the client, not from the cloud. And then you can only decrypt it using the key generated on your client. And then you pull that package down and you can decrypt it and you get the contents. And it's it's sort of um, kind of more like how a lot of messaging systems are going on mobile where you have a message and then the asset gets stored on the cloud. And this <laughs> in this case, the cloud is whatever you want it to be. Uh, and I think, you know, you, when you've already got, okay, so 
you got you got people who spent 10 years in the industry ladar creating what was the most secure email option of our time then he gets shut down by by fighting back against the um um I don't know, Powers national be, security basically. state, yeah. I guess. Yeah, yeah. And then you've got Silent Circle, who also shut down in, in spite of the national security state, who already have a, war, a working messaging protocol, right? They've already got it working. And they've teamed up, and they're saying, hey, we want to do this, and we want to open source it. And we want to, the way we want to make this happen is by giving money, money to developers. And then... I, you know, I think this is really chocolate and peanut butter coming together. I, mean, <laughs> I, really feel, I really feel like it is, you know? I feel like we're sitting here on the edge of like the first honest to goodness serious email replacement. Like we've got the motivations, we've got the technology, and we've got the people, right? And it's all but it's all going to be open source, and it's all going to run on Linux. Stuff. I'm is. excited to see it come to fruition. I really am. So uh, I so I was curious. I, I thought I'd I'd toss it here to the mumble room and ask you guys: uh, Is anybody not on board with the dark mail? Is anybody anybody have any issues, concerns, or doubts in this room? I just say it's about time. Yeah, yeah. Why do you think? We we needed this years ago. I agree. Actually, that was going to be my question to you guys. Is so th- their best effort here is they hire up a developer. I mean, we're best case scenario going to see something mid twenty fourteen, probably beta status, right? I mean, right. is that too long, you guys? Is that too far away? Because I feel like I need something right now. I wanted to deploy Zimbra and move everything like this year, and I'm now I'm sitting here, I'm seeing this, I'm like, ah, maybe I should wait for. Or Lava Bit 2.0 Dark Mail 1.0. What do you guys think, Mumble Room? Is it is it too far out? I think it's too late because I mean, if you think about it, this Snowden thing that happened. I mean, if we had something like this before the summer of Snowden, as he put it, then we wouldn't have as much issue with oh well, let's just switch everything over to this. Now we've got to wait too long to have that happen, and quite frankly. Everybody knows that email is already completely insecure. So get the dark mail going. It needs to happen quickly. We got BitMessage. Yeah, I mean, BitMessage is here today, but see, here's where here's where the dark mail system is superior. Is dark mail is, is it's mail, and then if you want, you can dial it down theoretically, and it can also do SMTP and communicate with older mail systems. So it gives you that... It gives you that transition, whereas where BitMessage is off on an island of its own. You got to use BitMessage to take advantage of BitMessage. The sender has to be on BitMessage. They've got to find it. They got to find you. Whereas this, in theory, could be integrated to existing mail products today, and it could even downgrade. So it starts at the highest level. Everything is encrypted from the email to the metadata, from top to bottom. Everything's encrypted, and you it's, also, encrypted. it's encrypted. You also, exactly. Then. You also Bit, might. BitMessage is its own island. It's its own ecosystem, whereas this integrates with everything. Yeah, and also because it's worked on the XMPP, you could even use it as a dark mail for instant messaging. Right, yeah. Sure. Okay, so uh, that's a great point, is mail is just going to be one aspect of what the system could deliver, whereas BitMessage is pretty much just for messaging. And uh, you'll, you'll probably, you'll, you'll be able to see uh, more people willing to adopt something like dark mail than, ju- than BitMessage. I think so, I think oh. so. I think the fact that it could support pictures and video uh, is kind of a big deal, because if you're going to replace email, don't you want to replace it with something that has more capabilities? Yes. Exactly. Yeah. My, my two cents is, is that if you're going to be replacing email, then you're going to need a bit of time for some of the companies such as Google and Microsoft to work with these guys uh, to develop a standard in a way that it suits businesses going forwards. Hmm. I don't. I don't see them being on board, though. Especially Not like Microsoft and Google. I mean, there's mm-hmm. so, at least right now the NSA is probably so integrated within those corporations right now that it'd be hard to have them even be interested in it. Then I think what the about biggest the key is going to be Red Hat. This is a crazy idea, but I think the way that uh, the first person, the first company who's going to jump on and actually provide a good service using dark mail is Yahoo. Hmm. That'd be interesting. They have. Oh, I see what you're saying because of their kind of the underdog, right? Right. They need something to pr- to yeah, give that, entice people. That would that would be a pretty nice feature. I kind of wonder if we aren't fighting the business model here, uh, and it it sucks because what all of these cloud providers uh, base their business model around is mining every bit of information about you, and even if it's just their robots doing it for to display ads. They have to be able to read the contents of the message, and it's not even like. 
oh, well, that'd kind of suck if we couldn't do it. No, it is like fundamentally key to their business model. It's how they analyze and sell you things. And so it is a mass, it is why they did mail. It's literally why they created an email service. That's why they did it. And so to take that context away from them essentially makes them run the mail service at a total loss. And so I don't see the commercial incentive for them to have their customers' contents encrypted on the drive, right? I mean, they're happy all day long to let you connect over an SSL connection, whoop de doo What they don't want is that data sitting in REST encrypted because then they can't mine it. And I think now, that might be the biggest thing they have to fight against. Well, they could turn it into a... Now, is this dark mail, is it mostly the protocol that they're focusing on? Yeah. On the back end? Yeah. yeah. So I wonder if it could be paired up with something like the mail pile for a good client. Well, LavaBit is talking, what they're talking about doing is re-releasing LavaBit as the, as a software package that integrates in the dark mail initiative. So you'd have the LavaBit mail server. I don't know what web front end would sit on. I don't know if I'd never use LavaBit. Maybe it had its own web front end. Uh, they want to repack. Okay, they want to repackage that as an open source project that inter- to be, quote unquote, a first class dark mail initiative citizen. But they feel like that those protocols could be used by anyone, but they're gonna it's like their Nexus device in a sense. I think the biggest issue is gonna be Red Hat. If Red Hat can uh, introduce this as their uh, server operating system and include it in their package along with updating GNOME's evolution to include it, then it's gonna be a big step forward. Well, well here's a here's a thought. I mean the reason I'm saying Yahoo would, would be a, an option for it is because of the the fact that they're an underdog right now, but also the commercialized part of it is they could pay they could chart they could do a dark mail service that is kind of like Google Apps for business so they could provide a dark mail that's completely secure but so they could Im- immediately be uh, like HIPAA compliant hmm so here's what I like about it yeah because it does provide a certain like um, regulation compliance and I like that if encryption happens this is why I like LastPass too because encryption happens on my end and on my client device and so then it, there's a little less risk in using a public service because they can't decrypt the data. Right. But you, as a backend service provider, not only do you lose the mining aspects of it, but you also lose like a lot of nice things like um, reducing multiple copies of files and, and all of that kind of stuff that you get when you can just look at the data. So I wonder if, if we're, if, I mean, I'm not saying that it's not going to be successful, but it seems like it might be a little more indie. Now they say they've already got like 32 companies that want to launch with Lava Bit or I'm sorry, dark mail support, right? Just yeah. built in. Does it have a <laughs> list of those companies on the page? No, they don't. They don't have anything up on that. No. Twenty bucks says half of them are uh, VPN providers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe because right. they're already in the privacy business. Why not? Right? Probably. Yeah, yeah. That that is interesting. Is you could do that. Well, I was thinking, you know, to go back to our to go back to our digital ocean sponsor. I was thinking like this would be there. You go. So you take a you take a five dollar a month server. You throw your di- your uh, dark mail initiative project on there, and you've got a mail server. No kidding. And it's just, I want to see this happen, but I feel like, I I, I guess, I, the the primary issue is there's email has been consolidated down to four or five big companies now to really do it, and so it seems like you got to get one or two of those big companies on board. Uh, that's- yeah, and I and really for one of those companies, it, it has to be a company that isn't wanting to try to get government contracts right, for their right. service because otherwise, they right. the government could hang that over their heads for them to get the data. Well, Yahoo's pretty good at like uh, uh, fighting requests for the data as well, um, so that's another reason why I suggest I thought they might be. My thing with it is as long as they keep it open source, that's the bigger picture here. <laughs> That's always been my one issue with BitMessage is it's uh, closed source and proprietary. You never know what they're doing in the Wait, back end. I thought, no, I thought BitMessage was open source. He's Did thinking BT Sync. He's thinking oh, BT Sync. Yeah, BitTorrent okay. Sync. Okay. Yeah. That one. Like, as long as they keep it open, like I'm fine with it because that like you can Does... be the best encryption ever as long as it's closed source. So mm-hmm. I still don't trust it. Yeah, and, and you know we've seen like with TrueCrypt, like when the when the project is important enough. Certain groups will, you know, sit down and do an official audit of the code. And that's why I think that is key just for a trust standpoint. Not even not even from everything else, but just from a trust standpoint. I think that's pretty key. All right. Any other thoughts on the dark mail before we move on, guys? Was dark mail not Was dark mail not already a thing on Tor at one point? So, you know, let's talk about that name. Yeah, because that name does, like, it, it, it brings up Darknet, right? Uh, yeah. 
Matt, what do you think? Is do they make a do they make a mistake with the name? Um, I think, as they pointed out, it's probably better in other names they could have gone with. But I do, I don't think it's gonna. It was definitely sounds like something that was developed uh, developed by developers. It sounds like something that is not <laughs> really hitting the mark as far as the consumer is concerned. They said their uh, their mo- their um, inspiration but, was know. the Dark Empire. Right, but uh, but at the same time, I, I applaud the name simply because it's going to attract the people that need to get a hold of it, the people that are going to roll it out on their right. own service that are going to actually work with it, and then provide it in more of a uh, to start out with, probably in a very niche or niche uh, uh, point of view. Maybe so. I should have called it Ninja Mail. Well, after the summer cool. of Snowden, maybe we need something that snapped us awake, right? Snowden mail, right? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> That's why I think Red Hat's a good contender for that because uh, if they already establish it and have it in their repositories, then businesses might see it and think, hey, we'll include this. And maybe not, they don't know what it is, but once they start offering that service, then they'll get users to like them. Well, also, no, go ahead. Also, go back to the open sourcing. Did he say what he was wanting to license his at? No. License it as yet? No. I haven't seen any license. No, I haven't seen any license. I hate it when they say open source. I thought he said GPL. Oh, did he? Because I haven't seen that. Okay. Okay. Because this would be good for BSD license to where anybody could just take take it and run with it. So there'd be a million different versions of it, like you said before. I can't stop them all. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Well, here's what Daniel said. Daniel wrote into the show and he said... Why people will not use dark mail, or at least why many people will be discouraged, is because of its name. Seriously, why can't they just call it Smail or Secure Mail or B Mail or Better Mail? This has, of course, nothing to do with the technical functionality, but with the average user's perception. Dark mail sounds well dark. It sounds dubious, just not right. Here in Germany, ISPs cooperations with the state try to promote something called D mail. He links to the D-mail uh, Wikipedia page. It says, for quote-unquote secure communication, the whole concept is not secure, but offering interception possibilities for law enforcement. Uh, but if I would have to explain some average computer user to, to why to use dark mail from the dark mail alliance instead of the DE mail uh, from German TCOM, they will look at me like I want them to commit a crime. We geeks are used to funny, ironic names and technical names like XMP, RFC, 25353, whatever. But the average user is not. Maybe we should keep in mind from time to time. Greetings from Germany and great shows, Daniel. So what happened I, to email 3.0? Yeah, email no, 3.0 is almost catchier. Yeah. So I think the thing to remember, too, is as this email pointed out, I agree with this latter part as far as the naming scheme and stuff in Linux is just atrocious But because I can't pronounce half of it. But, um, at, least but it, I th- at least it's not <laughs> y- your mail. Like yeah, this yet is another true. mail client. <laughs> Yeah, no kidding, right? But I think that the the intro point of it is that we need to remember that this is not a product that's going to be successful going straight to consumers. It's going to be targeted at some IT department at right. various companies. Uh, yeah. People that aren't going to read into the name other than, oh, hey, this is doing what I want it to do. Right. They can then rebrand it into something like, you know, Grandma's Good Time Cookie Mail or whatever the hell they want to call it. Good and, point. You know, <laughs> and you, you know, know what? The the name SMTP never really seemed to held, hold SMTP back. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. When's the last time you logged into your, you know, I mean, <laughs> yeah. come on. Users don't care about that. No, or pop bad. or IMAP. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Exactly. I, I I guess where I'm at is I'm left uh, still not knowing what to do. Like I I feel like I need to probably get off Gmail. Honestly, just because like last week when I lost access for a little bit, that was enough to freak me out. And yeah. then because I now I'm at a point where I have to pay for like every mailbox for a year when I want to create a new mailbox. That's annoying because I oh, know wow. you know it's they're not used that much that I need to do that. And so I would prefer to just roll my own, have my own system, but at the same time, I don't want to roll something out and then have this come out six months later and be like, oh, well, I really wish I would have switched to, I really wish I had that, and then switch all over again, right? So I'm just kind of in this holding pattern now. Well, and I think the main advantage to rolling your own is that if you control the domain, whatever's running in the back That's of your true. business. You That's know, true. So I could just point it at something else, but this is yeah. the time of it. You know, I got to It is the it. time, yeah. yeah. You're right. And uh, going back to our uh, previous uh, Linux Action Show, if we just get one of those robots. I know. I right? need it now. I need it now. I need it now. See, no it would be, take care of it. Yeah. yeah. You no, know it would be awesome with this is somebody would make a SUSE Studio version of this, like the uh, own cloud thing. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Just deploy a just deploy a dark mail alliance compatible mail server in seriously a few minutes. Yeah, that would be really yeah. cool. I, I gotta say, as far as branding dark cloud with that, <laughs> yeah, that's. I mean, it sounds like underground, or it sounds like <laughs> black market. You know. You're well, it's not like, right. the, it's not like they call it a brown mist or that. something. I mean, you, might, okay. you might as well call it like ha- hacker cloud or ominous cloud or silk mail. Well, so are That's you guys? <laughs> Red Hat would take a charge with that because the, they offer cloud solutions, and that just seems like the best key. Are you guys going to contribute to their Kickstarter, which we'll have yes. linked in the show notes? 
considering it. I'll likely throw a fiver. That's Definitely. About that. yeah. I would if I had any money. Yeah, I mean, there is that. I mean, I, I, I threw in 35. They kind of have a funky... So they, I mean... <laughs> Honestly, this seems like the loosest Kickstarter project I've ever seen because I thought Kickstarters were supposed to have like a seriously hard, like complete goal. And really the goal here is like, well, we'll hire some guys and they're going to work on it. So it's kind of the loosest Kickstarter ending I've ever seen. But they've got uh, a $25 spot. Oh, I could have sworn that was a $35 spot when I threw in. A $25 spot, a $100 spot, and then it goes to 1000 5000 and 10000 Wow. Yeah, I'll I bet they dropped it to 25 just to make it more accessible. Um, yeah, and you know, um, they're they're now at uh, 27,000 of 196,000. 22 days to go. They just launched it. But uh, when I threw in, they were like at 16,000. So, they've really they, it's going up pretty quick. And uh, 22 it seems, days to go. Good. Yeah. It seems loose, but the, because the, it's backed by the by uh, Ladar, it yeah. makes it okay for me to do it for the 25 at least. I agree. I feel like uh, I feel like it's totally fine. I I think just a reflection on how Kickstarter seems to be a little loose. If if it's good PR, they'll kind of allow a oh, yeah. looser def. That's yeah, fine. I mean, it's their it's their prerogative. But well, at the same time, if you got that loose of a uh, of an ending for it, it's not like yeah. You know, that just gives them some freedom to work on it how they need to. Mm. Mm-hmm. True. It's very sure. true. That's true. I wouldn't want to box them in too much. Uh, I want to cover a little bit of uh, two things before we before we run this week. Uh, first of all, I'd love to hear uh, your thoughts, audience out there, on uh, the Dark Mail Alliance and uh, replacing email with email 3.0. So email us. You can go to jupiterbroadcasting.com and click the contact link and choose Linux Unplug from the drop down. We'll cover your thoughts in our follow up next week. Last week, uh, we asked the audience to vote on uh, what they thought, which direction Debian would go. You remember this? Mm-hmm. Oh, and, yes. Uh, uh, we didn't get a ton of votes because I screwed up on how I linked and embedded the poll, but we still got enough votes. I think it's pretty telling. We got oh, yeah. no. <laughs> 208 votes total. Uh, 19% of the votes went to Upstart. 81% of the votes went to System D. Yeah. 81% of the people think it's going to go System D. Uh, That's on Debian. probably wishful thinking, though. I think so, right? Well, and what I want to know is because you have half, you probably, I'd say, you know, you have a large group of people that are doing this based on logic. You know, there's logical reasons why they're throwing their hat in a system, Dean. No, no question that. But there's also a fair handful of people that I firmly believe are throwing it in based on emotion. <laughs> and same thing with Upstart. I think people throw into Upstart for emotion too. I'd be interested in a poll that shows whether you're basing this on, you know, your emotional dislike for one of them or the fact that you really feel one is superior. I would love to see that. Yeah, here's the, here's the options to vote and now give it why. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. I, this, I wanted to keep it simple just to see what people, which way people would go. People are voting oh, again totally, now. Yeah. <laughs> people are voting right now and it's still going to System D. <laughs> <laughs> and that's totally expected. I mean, I, yeah. I knew it was going to yeah. go that direction overall. But, yeah. uh, it's going to be interesting to see the drama fallout. And then yeah. uh, either way, right? Either way, yeah. you think we're going to get we're going to get some interesting drama. So <laughs> kind of crazy. And uh, and the numbers increase. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They're, yeah. They're going up. The st- System D is still going up. Oh, oh, Upstart just got a vote. Well, there you go. <laughs> It's, it's fast and crazy. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, uh, all right. So um, maybe we'll do another poll again in the future. So, yeah. so next week on the Linux Action Show, so on Sunday, uh, mm-hmm. we'll be talking, if everything works out, with Joss from OpenSUSE. Uh, he is the community manager over there, and he's going to be at the Fedora Sus- uh, at Fedora at the Florida SUSCON, right? Is that what it's called? SUSCON? SUSCON. SUSCON, yeah. And uh, I, was, I was just kind of thinking maybe we'd brainstorm real quick here with the Mumble Room on what we should ask the open SUSE community manager when he's on the show. So Mumble Room, is there any burning questions that we, you think we should kick the open SUSE community manager's way? Don't forget 13.1's coming out soon. So that's in there. And of course, uh, uh, I've got a list of questions, but I, I wanted to open the floor and also to the audience um, listening on the download, just go over to Jupiter Broadcasting and click that contact link. You have a chance to send in, choose the Linux Action Show though, and send in your questions for the, uh, or start a thread in the subreddit, linuxactionshow.rad.com. Send in your questions okay. for Joss. I, I have a question, but it's not very, it's not like a broad, it's more specific, but it seems to be that OpenSUSE is the only distro that you netboot and doesn't work with. That and is I pretty broad. Why. Okay. Oh, well, I don't know if the community I, guy's going to. Yeah, I thought there was a couple don't other care, ones that do. I thought uh, Manjaro doesn't work with it either, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, right. He doesn't. Yeah, I, I'd be TV. curious about uh, OpenSUSE's plans for maybe implementing Wayland in the next couple of years. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. That's a good one. I mean, he might have the scuttlebutt on that. Maybe we can. Well, they would have to because of um, uh, KDE, wouldn't they? Oh, yeah. They're going to yeah. have to. Yeah. They're going to have to. Right. Keep in mind also, this is going to be an evergreen release. 
Oh, yeah. True. Yeah. So nice. maybe they're going to be a little more conservative, but uh, yeah, that's usually that's a good a gr- thing. That's a good point. So maybe – so probably anything we ask is would be then considered or pondering into future releases going down maybe a year or two. Rotten, did you yeah, see exactly. that uh, Big C just linked in the uh, chat room a OpenSUSE live USB stick creator? That might help you. That might help you get going. BD. Nice. Uh, ben, yeah, GD for the win. ben Diggs yep. in the chat room asked, maybe I should ask him about my sound issues in KDE. There we go. <laughs> oh wow! Well, they are tied in so tightly with KD. It would be interesting, and I did experience those same sound issues with an open sus, you know, with an open sus install. Well, so. so this is I was saying on the pre-show, I was going to. Uh, it's been so long since I've tried it on another distro, but uh, just a little background because I know a lot of people don't watch the Linux Action Show live right before last starts, and we're trying to stay on a schedule because we had uh, Frank from the uh, Own Cloud Project coming on, and we didn't want to make him wait. So yeah, right, and 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 the runs Linux pick was that now robot and it had a video, so I knew I wanted to. I knew the first thing out of the gate, as soon as we got into the show, I want to play a video, and I want to make sure that works because I hate you know to have it like right there in the show, at the beginning to have some sort of problem. So uh, I just do a little test run. I set my sound outputs. I get all the sound effects. I even like people. I even did like the little bark sound through the sound effects control panel, and the uh-huh. viewers at home were like, "Oh, you're making my dog go crazy, right?" We know it's working. It goes out over the live stream. Everything's solid. We tested it. We saw it on the VU meter. I I launch up Chromium. I load up the tab. I click play on the video, and the sound comes out my laptop speakers. And where it gets weird is that everybody's immediately going to go, oh, well, you just run, you just run the Pulse Audio uh, volume manager. Normally, that would be true. But in Chris's particular case, different tabs did different outputs. Yeah, no. That's weird. where it got weird. <laughs> that, that was that, so strange. Yeah, that's I, where it's like, okay, I lost, you lost me. It's got to be a flash <laughs> issue. It's got to be a flash issue. But it's like at the same time uh, – uh, how do you explain that? I, I just don't yeah. – I don't know. I don't. And then what can I fix it? Because I had to play the video. Um, and then like – Later on in that episode, you know, 30 minutes later, we did a Skype call with Frank and it was just fine. There was no sound problems at all. Right. <laughs> so, How about so support for kernel 312? With 312, they're going to have full Optimus support, even switching graphics cards. Right. Yeah, that is a big thing for laptop users. Also, I was gonna, like, what about the installer? Because I wonder if they're ever going to uh, update their installer because that thing is still pink. Beautiful, you mean? I've had issues with it, though, like the partitioning part. Really? I I, I yeah, haven't. I never uh, have. I've had issues no. with Butter FS installs. installs. What file systems are you guys using for when you're having problems? ZFS. No, Butter ZFS. Butter <laughs> FS. <laughs> okay, here's yeah. something I'd be interested in asking. My laptop is currently running OpenSUSE 12.3. I wonder how would an in-place upgrade to 13.1 work compared to doing a clean install? Hmm, okay. Good question. You could just do Tumbleweed, couldn't you? That's what I was. So I was wondering uh, what you guys thought. Like, should I during the review? I guess during the review, I'll do the thirteen one, and then maybe after the review, maybe I can try going for a week on tumbleweed or something. That's what I, I would do. From a while, but yeah, yeah. My issue with tumbleweed is some of the uh, uh, build service packages don't work with it. Mm. Yeah. Oh, that could be a pain in the butt. That's an I, excellent point. Yeah. yeah good, point, good point. Yeah. There's quite a bit in the build service that don't work with tumbleweed. Yeah. Yeah, okay. There, there's a there's an option in the the OBS to make it work with Tumbleweed, but you have to do extra steps for it. Make it show. So maybe they should just have a checkbox or a, you know, something. Be nice. Mm-hmm. Well, guys, uh that does bring us to the end of this week's Linux Unplugged. You know, uh we have gotten I I I have stopped I've stopped reading them on air because we get so many emails from folks talking about their switch to Arch. And I, and I think that's so cool that so many people are trying it out. And the only reason I haven't covered it is because I didn't want to make this these shows like some sort of arch in, you know promotion platform. But at the same right. time, I think it's so cool that people are trying it after they saw us try it. And a lot of people are having really good success. I think it's just fun to step outside the box and see what is happening in other distributions as well. And uh, so one of the things I want to do in the near ter- nearest term what I mean before January, uh, mm-hmm. I'd like to talk to Antegros and Manjero developers as well. So if yeah. we have uh, Manjero developers out there listening, uh, go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com and click the contact link and choose Linux Unplugged from the dropdown. I'd love to get you guys on Mumble and chat with you about what you're working on because um, I have a feeling we're sending a lot of people your way. And uh, I'd like to ask you a few questions about how your system works, how it differentiates itself from Arch, and where you're going in the long run. So that's a, that's another invite I want to put out there. But thanks to the Mumble Room for uh, hanging out with us this week and uh, chewing on all of this S. And you guys will have a link to the Kickstarter project for the Dark Mail Initiative if you want to go in and maybe help them. Uh, it's the wrong show. If you want to go in and maybe help them uh, get to their goal, well, then we'll have a link so you can do that. And we'll keep you posted on their progress 
Matt, I think we're going to have a really good show on Sunday. We'll be talking oh, to Joss right. while he's in Florida. Oh, right on. Cool. I know. That'll be fun. And don't forget, everyone, you can join us live. Go over to jblive.tv at 2 p.m. Pacific on a Tuesday. We've also got jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar where you can find out what time the show is live in your neck of the woods. What's great about joining us live is not only can you participate in the mumble, but you can participate in our IRC chat. You can help us name the show. And we've got a lot of fun in the pre and post shows after we're all done with Linux Unplugged. Linux Unplugged is out every Tuesday and Linux Action Show is live on every Sunday. All right, everyone. Thanks so much for hanging out with us on this week's episode of Linux Unplugged. Matt, I'll see you on Sunday, all right? I'll see you Sunday. All right, everyone. We'll see you right back here next Tuesday. <laughs>